We have uh, one set of minutes to approve, February 28th. Did everybody get a chance to look at those on the S drive? Representative Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Madam Chair. I would move the minutes as posted on the S drive. Okay. Motion by Representative Johnson, second by Representative Neighbor to approve the minutes from February 28th. All in favor say aye. aye. Opposed, no? Okay. We have minutes approved. Um, okay. Today we just, we, we've um, got a treat. We've got um, a presentation uh, from ba Brain Balance Achievement Centers. Um, I'll tell you, uh, Representative Carr um, planned a tour in Wichita, and I um, drove down and went on that with, we had one other person, Representative Carr, who do we have with us? Um, oh, so, yeah, Representative Miller. Um, so I, I thought it was very interesting and thought you all might um, enjoy learning about it too. So I'm just going to turn the floor over to Dr. Rebecca Jackson, and she's um, on WebEx this morning, afternoon, this afternoon, sorry. Yes, hi. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Wonderful. Well, first and foremost, um, thank you for introducing us as a treat. <laughs> that makes me so proud. Um, and I appreciate it. I know how busy you all are. So thank you so much for giving us the time to introduce who we are and, and what we do at Brain Balance. I'm going to start today by just giving a brief introduction to who I am, who Brain Balance is, and then share a little bit of some of the highlights of our recent research of Brain Balance program outcomes. And then I'm going to turn it over to Michelle Robertson, who is a local person there in Kansas and owns a Brain Balance Center there in the community. Um, so to start, just my quick background. After college, my graduate work was as a chiropractor, and I pra practiced in private practice for a decade. And then when I had my children, I sold my practice to stay home. And that's when my interest really peaked in wanting to learn and understand more about child development and how to optimize cognition and development in today's kids. So after I sold my practice, I did additional classwork in pediatric development in cognition, and then most recently at the George Washington University Medical School, I've done work in their clinical translational research program, which is what has led me to do the research that I've done at Brain Balance. Um, and I believe there's a presentation. I don't know who runs the deck. Are you able to pull that up? Or I can pull it up and screen share. Um, I think we're able to do it here. Okay, whatever's easiest. Do you have the slides? I, I do. Oh. So if you want me to. Okay. Oh, you have them. Oh, okay. If you can share your screen, let's do it that way. Yep. And get it back to the beginning. Okay. okay, so we, we have a copy of them. Is it in the folder? Okay, so we also have a copy of the presentation. Okay, wonderful. Are you able to see my screen okay at this point? Yes. Okay, great. I'm always proud when I can manage technology. Um, so Brain Balance is a program that's focused on building and optimizing brain health for kids, teens, and adults. We are a drug-free integrative multimodal approach to improving attention, behavior, and cognition. Brain Balance is a nationwide franchise organization, and we have over 70 locations across the country that have been in existence since about 2008. We also have an at-home virtual program, which has allowed us to expand our reach, and we've worked with over 55,000 families and have worked with families in over 40 different countries. We consistently get great reviews from our families and participants, as well as having the research to demonstrate the efficacy of our program outcomes. So the program, as I mentioned, is a drug-free, integrative, multimodal approach to build and optimize brain health and development. And the program is focused on helping kids, teens, and adults 
build and strengthen pathways in the brain by integrating cognitive activities, sensory stimulation, and physical engagement, and then all supported by healthy nutrition. So it's a program that's focused on exercising the brain much in the same way we exercise our body to be strong and healthy, targeting very specific networks and pathways in the brain that help us sustain attention and focus and to manage and regulate our mood and emotions. So at Brain Balance, our focus is on the brain. And I'm going to share with you the World Health definition of brain health. So this is from the World Health Organization, and they state that brain health is the state of brain functioning across cognitive, sensory, social, emotional, behavioral, and motor domains, allowing a person to realize their full potential over the life course, irrespective of the presence or absence of disorders. And this definition is so important because it, what it tells us is that brain health is not just our mood and emotions, but it's our cognition. And our cognition is our ability to pay attention, to block out distractions, it's our memory and our ability to learn. It's also our sensory processing, how we take in and process the sensory input happening in the world around us, as well as our social, emotional, and behavioral health, and then physical coordination. So brain health incorporates all of those domains, and those are all of the domains necessary for our kids to be able to be successful in the classroom environment, to learn, take in information, and then apply it when it's needed, as well as to manage their mood and emotions and behaviors to have age appropriate behavior in the classroom and age appropriate social interactions and experiences. So again, at Brain Balance, we're focused on the brain because we understand that everything starts in the brain. Our brain determines how we experience life physically, emotionally, and socially. It's all dependent on our brain health and development. So what does development have to do with brain health? What brain development is, is the formation and refinement of neural networks in the brain. As we develop the networks and pathways in our brain become more organized, faster and more efficient so that we have better control of our actions and behaviors and improved ability to learn and interact. And the formation and refinement of brain pathways involves building new connections, making existing connections faster and more efficient, and the brain actually prunes or gets rid of the less efficient pathways. So that over time, through use and challenge, our brain is more successful in what it is that we're trying to do as we learn and interact. And again, that brain refinement and brain development happens over time through use and challenge. So what happens if the healthy trajectory of development has gone off track for a child is that child or individual is going to have less in the way of the improved refinement and organization in the brain networks and pathways. This means their networks and pathways are going to be more immature. And a brain that's more immature is going to have a harder time sustaining attention and focus a harder time blocking out distractions, and a harder time managing their mood and emotions when they're frustrated or upset or faced with challenges in life. And these disruptions can pres be present at any age. So it's not just about kids, even though at Brain Balance, that is what we started is with the kid program that's now expanded to work with adults as well. So while many of the individuals that we work with do come to us with a label or a diagnosis such as ADHD, anxiety, autism, you do not need a label or a diagnosis in order to experience gaps in healthy development that can interfere with your ability to sustain attention, block out distractions, and regulate mood and emotions. So knowing that the goal is improved brain health and optimized development, at Brain Balance, we leverage the principles of neuroplasticity, which simply means that the brain is able to change. So our program is essentially a fancy exercise program for the brain to make those brain networks and pathways faster and more efficient and to build endurance. And we do that by following the principles of neuroplasticity, which means the program needs to be intense. 
It needs to be repetitive and it needs to be progressively challenging in order to change the brain in a meaningful and positive way. So our program creates challenge by making the exercises and activities progressively more challenging and more complex over time. So that's the, the quick introduction to the overview of who we are and what we do. And now I'm going to spend just a little bit of time highlighting the outcome. So when we approach optimizing brain health and development through neuroplasticity, what are the results of the work that we do? So this is sharing with you our growing body of evidence that indicates that the Brain Balance Program is consistently driving meaningful and significant change in the areas of attention, in reducing symptoms of ADHD, of improving cognitive skills, which again includes attention, memory, and our ability to learn, as well as in overall well-being. And these improvements are consistently reported by both parents and clinicians, as well as teachers in the classroom and through measurements of diagnostic activities and development. So the first study I'm going to highlight is from the Journal of Humanities and Social Sciences and Communication. And this study was looking at the reliable change of parent rated scores of ADHD. So what that means in science speak is how consistently are parents reporting changes or a reduction in the ADHD symptoms. And what this study demonstrated is that there's an 81% reliability in change. So that means 81% of brain balance participants experience positive reductions or change from pre to post program. So while there's no silver bullet and no one thing that works for all students and individuals, an 81% score of reliability is something that we're tremendously proud of. The next study that I want to highlight was published in the Psychiatry Research Journal, and this was an independent study done by the Harvard McLean Medical School, looking at a control group study with children with ADHD. And what this study demonstrated was a marked reduction in ADHD symptoms as reported by parents and clinicians, as well as measured through diagnostic testing. And the largest areas of impact were seen in a reduction in hyperactivity, in inattention, and improved accuracy on cognitive tests. And what was important to note in this study is that this study found that the brain balance program was as effective as a low dose medication in alleviating symptoms of ADHD. So an exercise program having positive change in attention and cognition without the need for medication. The next study we published in conjunction with Cambridge Brain Sciences, and this study was looking at changes in cognition as a result of completing the Brain Balance Program. This was a control group study that saw significant overall improvement in all measures of cognition that were a part of this um, study, and the largest improvements were measured in areas of concentration, memory, reasoning, and verbal abilities, all key functions needed to succeed in the classroom. And improvements in attention and planning were noted as early as one month in to the program. The next study is from the Journal of Mental Health and Clinical Psychology. And this study was looking at parent reported improvements in the areas of anxiety and social emotional functions. This study was working with anywhere from 495 to 1,200 students, depending on the category of information we were looking at. And parents reported consistent change in their child's overall levels of happiness, a reduction in worries and anxiety, as well as improvements in social emotional regulation, including expressing and regulating emotions, and in social engagement, again, reported by parents. The next study was a school pilot control group study where we delivered the brain balance program on site at a school. And what was exciting about this study is we added teachers into this study. So we consistently get the perspective of parents and we're consistently able to measure change in the students themselves. But with this study, we wanted to add in the perspective of teachers. What were teachers noticing as a difference in children as a result of doing the brain balance program and how that impacted the classroom experience. And the study found a 
significant reduction in ADHD scores for the areas of inattention and the combined inattention, hyperactivity, and impulsivity subtypes of ADHD, with teachers noting improvements in the students' attention and classroom behaviors, which is so important to today's classroom. And then finally, the last study I want to highlight was um, a study just published a few months ago in the um, journal Frontiers in Psychology. And this was a study looking at program outcomes on over 4,000 individuals who participated in the program. And what we looked at in this study is we measured the multiple areas of brain health domains. So looking at those categories of social emotional development, behavior, cognition, and this study found a large to very large effect size in all domains of development measured in this study. And what we found was that the larger the deficit was for the child at the start of the program, the larger the change was as a result of doing the program. So consistent change across the board, but the largest change was seen in the kids that needed it most. Um, and again, in science speak, a large to very large effect size um, is extremely significant, something we're tremendously proud of. And it's enough change that, again, it translates over into real life. So not just change in the areas that we measure, including motor coordination, um, eye motor movement, um, auditory and visual processing, and fine motor development, um, but also um, changes that the parents could observe in real life in behavior, emotional regulation, and cognition. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Michelle Robertson, who is again um, local to Kansas. So thank you again for your time and allowing me to participate today. I really appreciate it. Okay. <clears throat> thank you very much for your presentation. Are, will you be able to stay online in case we have questions? Absolutely. Okay. All right. So welcome. There we go. Is that better? Can you hear me? Okay. Better. We can Hello. hear you. <laughs> Thank you for letting us talk with you today about something that we love. We know you're very busy and we appreciate it. My name is Michelle Robertson and I'm the executive director for Brain Balance. In addition, I'm also a licensed clinical marriage and family therapist in the state of Kansas. I've been a clinician for about 26 years, and I've been licensed and practicing in Kansas for a little over 20, or I think I'm about to be 20 years. I'm also a tenured faculty member at Friends University in Wichita. I teach in the grad program there and the Master of Science and Family Therapy degree. That is a program that trains clinicians to become marriage and family therapists. So I do educational elements, clinical supervision, and then I also have my own practice. That's what I went to school for. That is what I thought I wanted to do, still is what I wanted to want to do. I always knew I wanted to be in the helping profession. I didn't go looking for brain balance. Brain balance found me. Um, that's a story that would take too long to go through today, and I'm happy to tell anyone who's interested after. But what it led me to do was go on a research effort to determine and understand what is brain balance. Even though I'd heard great things about it, the program where I teach is a neuroscience-based program. That basically means we've been teaching mental health in the context of brain development for over two decades. So I needed to know this thing with brain balance, what was it? Did it align with what I'd been teaching? Did it align with what I believed and knew and what I'd been teaching my students? And not only did I find after the almost three years of research and contemplation, not only did it align, it actually began to answer questions that I had about my own clinical work that I couldn't I didn't know I had questions, but it answered them. I knew that my traditional training as, a, as an MFT and as a therapist only move the needle so far, especially with children and especially with for those who had been impacted by those childhood adverse events, those um, ACEs um, and trauma, basically. So here's what I found, and you've already heard, let me see if the slides will come up. Um, on the overhead. I don't know how you'd like to do that, but how does the program work and what did I find? The five domains slide is where I am. The connectivity impacts all brain health domains. Let's see if it'll pull up. You already heard Dr. Jackson talk about them, but if you look at that list, I was trained to handle two of those. 
behavioral and socio social emotional at best. Maybe I would touch cognitive if I had particular training, but I did not and was not trained in how to handle all five domains. Well, the World Health Organization has determined this as the definition and then research has shown us that all five of these domains work together. Those five elements have to work and they're interrelated in order for us to have optimal brain health. So it pose, basically that would say if we made change in one domain, we could affect change in all domains. But that also said on the flip side that if there was a problem or is a problem, an underconnectivity or an immaturity in any one of these areas, then it also negatively impacts all, right? We can't have it one way if we don't have it the other. So it begged the question for me as a therapist, what happens when there's an issue in a domain of brain functioning in which I'm not trained to address? That happened often. So what, what does that mean? What I learned in standing here before you today is that what differentiates brain balance from anything else that I am aware of in my own research and my profession is that this is a service that hits all five areas at once. What we say at Brain Balance, we've totally stolen this from neuroscience, is what fires together, wires together. So in the neuroscience world, it's neurons that fire together, wire together, and that is what we're about. So we engage multiple systems simultaneously and then exercise those systems over and over and over in order to build brain health. We make the brain stronger, faster, and more efficient, and you heard Dr. Jackson talk about that. When we do that, we're able to pay attention for longer, block out distractions, more consistently manage our moods and our emotions, and therefore our disruptive behavior. We're gonna be able to retain information longer, stronger, faster, more efficiently, develop social, meaningful relationships with the people around us. And we do that, if you can see from the slide, Brain Balance does that, and it does it with key developmental exercises and nutritional support. So if we talk about those domains, Dr. Jackson mentioned that very last study, the one where she noted that we just published this one in 2023, and it had over 4,000 participants. I noticed that my slide says 3,000, and I apologize, it's 4,000. Now that we have looked at all five of those domains and you've heard the results of that, this is evidence that brain balance addresses all domains of brain health. So we know that there are a lot of therapies out there, like my mental health world, where we're trained in a few, but not all of them. What makes brain balance so effective and so different? You've heard a couple of these words already, but if you hear nothing else that I say today, I hope you take away two words. We are integrative and we are multimodal. So integrative means that we use multiple research-backed methods to drive connectivity and brain development. We're not just focused on behavior or a symptom. We're not just focused on sensory perception, for example. We're engaging all domains of development in order to, dri to drive connectivity. And the word multimodal gives a clue into how we do that. We use multiple different tools simultaneously and we target those multiple systems at the same time. Again, what fires together, wires together. So we wanna engage as many key networks and pathways in the brain as we can simultaneously, and we do that with those multiple tools like sensory, visual, auditory, tactile tools while we work things like core muscle strength, fine motor skills, balance, coordination. That's how we do it. And that's how the brain develops. It's what leads us to see the symptoms disappear and reduce. How do we do that? This is an overview of the Brain Balance program. First, our program begins with an assessment. Everyone that comes to us goes through an initial assessment that helps us to offer where they are in their current brain functioning. Then that assessment tells us how much program engagement it will take to get them from where they are to where they should be, to their maximum brain health. We're not a one-size-fits-all program, thankfully. Each student who comes in gets an individualized, tailored program. It's not one-size-fits-all. Now, the national average across all of our centers is five months. It takes about five months of program overall. But we know that any amount of program drives change. 
So we've offered you a three month example here. We work with students in our center, so our in-center program, we also have the virtual, but we have our in-center program. We work with kids and adults three times a week for an hour. It's a good amount of time. During that hour, they're not coming in and sitting at a computer with someone at the front of the classroom. These kids are up and active and engaged throughout that hour. They're progressing. You heard Dr. Jackson talk about <laughs> that we're making things harder and harder for them. If you've ever done any sort of workout or training program, you don't expect to be doing the same thing in week six that you were doing in week one or in week 12 that you were doing in week six, and we don't either. If you've, if you've been around long enough, like I have, to have remembered the infomercial, I think his name was Ron Popeil, and he talked about the set it and forget it. You remember you could put your food in the little machine and turn it on and set it and forget it, and your food is just magically gonna be done. We are not that program. We are a data-driven program. What we do, we monitor. So what a kiddo does in day one influences what they do in day two, which informs what they do in day three and continuously throughout the program. It needs to be harder and more complex to drive that kind of change. Our directors are analyzing data all along the way. Again, no set it and forget it. They're analyzing data and making adjustments to each child's program as needed. Then our families come in. So in addition to the three times a week, we meet with the caregivers monthly. We're providing them an update and data on where they're where they are, what's moving, how are things looking. We're getting information from them as well. And during that meeting, we're checking in and offering parent coaching. If you or anyone around you has ever parented a difficult child, you know how taxing that is. We know that and we understand that. And we're providing parent coaching all along the way. In addition, we meet with the teachers. These kids spend a lot of time every day in the classroom. And part of our program is a collaboration with the schools that we're meeting with the teachers. Our staff have even been members of teams at their, uh, in their classroom, in their setting to help make sure that they're academically succeeding. We communicate what's happening in, in brain balance, what we know, and then collaborate around what might work for them. And you heard about our study and the delivery in the school. It's continuing to tell us vital information about how we can help these children in all aspects of their lives. We're providing nutrition coaching. Nutrition is a key element in brain development. We're not asking parents to go crazy and change everything about their lives. We're creating sustainable nutrition change that can help them and help these kids grow and develop. But we're not done. We have a 24-7 parent portal, and it is loaded with lots of resources, videos, and how to do these support exercises at home. We have nutrition, shopping lists, menu planning, and then we have parent resource information in that portal that they have access to all throughout the program. And then we're still not done. When they're finished with their in-center program, we have a post-enrollment time. Every kiddo that comes to us and works hard and they drive the kind of change that they're looking for, we know the brain continues to grow and develop. We walk with that family up to a year after they've completed the program in the center and we work with them on continued choices in nutrition and parent coaching and helping them with their exercises. Brain continues to develop luckily all the way up until 25 and and also beyond, but the developing brain needs that help and support and we offer that as well. Please know, I come from a world where every little thing is billed out separately. We have this and you charge this and this and you charge this and this and you charge this and that is not the way brain balance works. Everything that I said is all part of the, the, the tuition and being in center. So we don't charge parents extra for anything. This is the program, we can't slice and dice it. So how does this matter for Kansas? Why are we excited to be able to talk to you? I've already mentioned those adverse childhood experiences and we know the impact of trauma on child brain development. It leads to all kinds of gaps in skills and behavior. It's why we see our kids fluctuate, why they can do something well one day and not do it well the next. And that makes it difficult 
for these kids to manage their moods, their reactions, engage socially. And as I mentioned, traditional services don't hit all the places these kids need. And in Kansas, unfortunately, we are painfully aware that not all of our families who need this can access our services because we're unable to take the thing that they need to be able to pay for our services and a medical card. We've discounted, we've completely written off services across the last seven years to try and alleviate that, but it isn't enough. And that systemic barrier means Kansas kids, the ones who need us the most, can't come to us. Since opening this center seven years ago, I have also opened a center in Minnesota and in Tennessee. And our Minnesota center has access to two separate waiver funding sources across two states, both Minnesota and Wisconsin. And we've been delivering our brain balance program to those kiddos for several years. We hope someday our Kansas kids can be included. We've served over 1,000 families. We've seen and assessed over 1,000 families in Kansas. 60% of those are from the Wichita area, the zip codes in and around the city where we're located, but 40% of those come from an hour drive or more. We even routinely have families driving from Hutchinson, McPherson, Harper, Mulvane, driving into the center, not to mention the numbers of families since launching our virtual program almost four years ago statewide. We would love for you to know that we are available and we are proven. You've heard Dr. Jackson speak about our important research and it's gonna continue to come. But beyond that, we've been partnering in the foster community for years. We've been attending parent support events. We've been providing free education monthly to families all across the state. And we know that foster agencies and parents are in the position where they're creating support systems, right? And we've been lucky to be a part of that because they know that this kind of care, any care is critical for those kids that they're taking care of. I know this from my own personal experience as a mental health clinician. There's wait lists. Everyone has wait lists if you can get in. And then those who, if you can, they often don't have after school appointments or evenings or weekends. Not only is Brain Balance open uh, after school, that is the target of our program. Our program hours are after school. We also go well into the evening so that even parents don't have to miss work in order for their children to come to us. And as I said, we have been doing this in Minnesota, and we know that the hard work, we are aware of the hard work and specialized training that it takes to help the most vulnerable in our community. Our service is systemic, if you haven't heard that with the integrative word. But systemic I use is a very sacred word uh, for me as a marriage and family therapist. It's, it's systems thinking is the soil around which my whole profession grew. It's one that demands attention to the biological, psychological, and social aspects of every human, and I believe brain balance takes that even further. Not only do we improve brain functioning of the child, which I've mentioned, we advocate for them, we educate the family, collaborate with the school, and coach and teach about nutrition. But this one was really important that I wanted to highlight. As I was evaluating my involvement in brain balance, I knew that it couldn't be at the cost of any other important service, particularly mental health. And that's the case. We don't compromise what the child needs. We work hard to connect kids and families to other services whenever necessary. We build a strong referral network with professionals and organizations in Kansas who know what we're doing, they believe in what we're doing, and they understand it, and they've partnered with us to make change. A couple of slides more. Um, I, brain balance is another option. We hear a lot from people who come to us. They seek us because they're not interested in a diagnosis. They don't necessarily want an option of medication. And those are all of personal reasons. Sometimes they don't want the stigma of a label. Sometimes they don't necessarily want to put their children on medication for various um, personal reasons. And you heard Dr. Jackson say, and that's okay. Whether someone has a diagnosis or not, when they come see us, that's fine. In fact, we aren't against medication or diagnosing in any way. We just simply 
don't do it because it isn't necessary in order for us to help. We're addressing things at the root level, not at the symptom level. We are working hard to create stories in our communities, focusing on the whole child and their support system and creating wide systemic change. I'm gonna close my um, presentation today and read to you a quote by a man named Paul Bradour who said this, statistics are human beings with the tears wiped away. Now, as an academic, I have a deep appreciation for statistics and outcomes and quantitative numbers, and we've shared those with you today. But as a therapist, I have an even deeper appreciation for stories and lived experiences of anyone we touch. So in your folders in the next three sheets, you'll see we have some statements. These are statements from current or recently enrolled Either a student has offered it for us or a family who has brought a child to us. And I would just invite you to take a minute and read through some of those statements. And I'll scroll through them on the screen as well. I believe these statements speak to the support our families have received from our highly trained and compassionate staff, the improvements experienced by themselves and their children, and the life-altering changes that have been made. One of our favorite things is that we make breakthroughs possible. Together, we can make breakthroughs possible. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Um, you answered a lot of my questions as you went through the presentation. So, Wonderful. Um, can you, uh, let's see, what are the ages that you? We began our program at four years old, and then our, our main child program goes through 17, and then we also have a program for 18 and up. So, we have an adult program as well. So, how does that work with foster kids? Um, if they, if they move from one home to the other, it, you, you're switching which parents you're working with. I mean, what are your what what do you deal with with that? And we've actually had that happen in Minnesota that a child will go from one system or one setting to another setting, and as long as they're not moving outside of the area, which in Kansas they wouldn't be, then we just transition and we'll do education with the new foster family and make sure that they are aware of what we're doing and are brought into that process as if they began with us. Uh, committee, do you have questions? Representative Pickert. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so if you work with kids that are in foster care, how is that paid for? Because a lot of them are on Medicaid, right? At this present moment, the only option is private pay. How expensive is it? So our program ranges, it's about $200 a session, and so it's dependent on the number of in-center sessions that they need, and again, no extra cost. So whether they needed three months or five months or six months is determined in that price, and then all of those additional resources are rolled in. So by private pay, mm -hmm. is that 
include insurance? It does not. Okay. Right? Um, it does not. Can I ask another question? Okay. Um, what's the preparation for um, the staff that work with the families and the children? Okay. You have to use a, 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 a dumb down word. A what? Well, uh, the people that work yes. with the children, um, are they... All okay. what, are, what is their are background in training? Therapists or, you know, physical therapists or what sure. do you... Yeah. All of our um, staff, they'll have different um, background and training. So our directors are typically either um, bachelor's prepared or master's prepared um, educated. Our coaches will range from having already completed. Most of them are in their master's programs now. But there isn't a particular background that's required to be a coach. We put everyone through our mindset training, which is used often in foster systems across the country, and then they're all trained specifically in our protocol. There's no place we can send folks. We're the only ones doing what we're doing, so we can't send them to get a degree and then they'll be ready. We fully train them inside our center with our protocols. Yeah, thank you. Representative Powell. So obviously not the same program, but um, I used a multimodality uh, program for one of my children, uh, probably 20 years ago, yeah. um, and it was about a $2,000 price tag. Mm -hmm. And it was probably similar, it had some similarities to what you're talking about here. Uh, the good news is it was very effective. Yeah. And I had a very bright, intelligent child who uh, I was actually educating myself, and this child mm. was extremely bright and could assimilate and remember large amounts of inf information uh, auditorily, but processing it through uh, reading and, and being able to put it back out onto paper was nearly an impossibility. And even in early elementary years, we were spending mm, eight, 10 hours a day just trying to get through schoolwork. Mm. Wow. So um, anyway, the program that we used uh, had similar layers to what you're talking about and coaching several times a week and a lot of exercises at home. And it was very rigorous. Yeah. <laughs> it was a lot of work and it was a lot of money, but we were able to, and insurance did not cover it. Um, but we were able to have like a payment program, that yes. kind of thing. I assume you guys Absolutely. offer something like that. Absolutely. Yes. So we'd be similar. And the way I offer it to parents is, you know, you walk in to learn that your child needs braces and they would like all of their money right then. So there's things like care credit. We accept care credit, as a matter of fact, and we also have um, other options, your tuition solutions that help families make this affordable. Yeah. And then also, I'm just wondering, it doesn't look like it based on your presentation, but does this get into things such as um, uh, dyslexia, things of that nature at all? So again, we're not necessarily addressing the diagnostics of something. So do we have people who come to the center who report symptoms of dyslexia or symptoms of ADHD and symptoms of dysgraphia? Yes, we do. Yes. Other questions? Representative Carr. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, just a, a question with respect to those kids who have um, a previous previous diagnosis and are on um, medication. And thank you, by the way, um, for um, coming in and providing us with this presentation. Uh, do you see any significant differences in those children that are medicated versus um, those children who are not regardless of diagnosis? I might kick that to Dr. Jackson. She'd probably be able to speak to that at a larger level. Yeah. You know, for us, we don't track whether the child is taking medication or not taking medication. Uh, that's a, a conversation and a decision that's between the, the parent, the guardian, and the physician. Um, but whether or not a child is medicated, they're able to go through our program. Um, and when we've been able to stratify our outcomes looking at medicated versus non-medicated, and again, we don't track that in all students, we haven't seen discernible difference. And so that is a 
personal decision that every parent and caregiver makes, and it is completely okay, whatever that choice and decision is, and it doesn't change how we deliver our program, nor does it change the expectations of the program. And uh, towards the beginning of the presentation, um, uh, there was mention made of, uh, of, of the brain's growth based on things that um, uh, the, the cognitive skills and, and things, how, how it develops. Um, does that mean that if, if those skills aren't worked on early in life that the brain then does not develop um, at all or um, does it develop at different levels? Um, can you speak to that for just a moment? I don't mean to avoid your question, but I'm going to let Dr. Jackson answer that because she's <laughs> definitely more qualified. <laughs> Um, you know, the, the brain is absolutely incredible, and what we know is the brain can change and develop at any age, but the skills that we, we rely on as adults, all of you sitting in this room today are using your executive functions, your ability to sustain attention, block out distractions, form memories, make connections with other information. If there are disruptions in childhood development, it makes it harder to develop the executive functions we need to succeed in life. So we know that childhood development is foundational for being able to develop sustained attention, memory, cognition, emotional regulation, and control. The good news is we know that the brain can change at any age. So even if we have an 18 year old, a 25 year old that's struggling with anxiety, that's struggling to, you know, maybe they're struggling to in college, get their work done and turned in or struggling to make it to work on time. We know that going back and filling in developmental gaps is helping to improve sustained attention um, even in the adults. We've, that's um, the next study that we're working on publishing right now and we're seeing in adults the largest changes in the areas of sustained attention and reductions in impulsivity. Um, so childhood development is key, um, but it, there's not a, you've missed the boat and you're stuck. Um, there still are opportunities for the older brain to develop as well. Did that answer your question? Indeed, yeah, thank you. Okay, great. Representative Owsley. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you both for being here for the presentation. Um, if brain is your business, I have to ask, have you all noticed um, effects on COVID? Have you seen kids coming in with, that have had COVID and are displaying symptoms that you might see in your practice? You know, Michelle, is it okay if I keep talking? Absolutely. <laughs> Sorry, thank you. Love it. Um, um, again, we don't track medical conditions. Um, and so I don't have a database that I can filter by students that have had COVID. What we know about the brain is COVID drives inflammation and high levels of inflammation can block and interfere with healthy development. So if I have a child that already struggles a little bit with attention and focus and emotional regulation, and now post virus, they have high levels of inflammation, we're gonna see an exacerbation of those underlying symptoms and concerns. So they're going to have an even harder time paying attention and even harder time regulating their mood and emotions. What we've also seen that I am able to track in the data, we've had a change in difference in the development of our kids after the years of the sustained pandemic. Um, I actually just recently published a book with Mayo Clinic um, on looking at the impact um, that the COVID years have had on the development of our kids. We have increased rates of ADHD, anxiety and depression in our kids. We have larger achievement gaps. And as a society, we did what we needed to do to stay safe through the pandemic. But when our kids had less sensory input, they had less in-person learning. Not only did it interfere with their learning, it had a negative impact on their development. And we're seeing this in brain imaging, we're seeing this in social emotional development. You hear reports um, of teachers where there's increase in disruptive behaviors in the classroom since the return to mainstream classroom post pandemic. Um, so absolutely the COVID time period has had a very real impact on the development of our kids, um, both directly and indirectly. Thank you for that. And if, if you would, you said that uh, those studies were just published. Yes, um, there's, so I'm going to reference my book. The book is back on track and there's, 
I, hundreds of references in the book referencing studies on the changes that we've seen. I'm happy to send over a follow up email um, to highlight a couple particular studies for you if that's helpful. It, it would be. Um, and I asked that question not only being on the child welfare committee here, but being on a, uh, an education committee as well. And we've seen, you know, talking to our counselors, yeah. our superintendents, our educators, um, not only the uptick in behavior, but the uptick in IEPs for kids. So um, I, I was just curious what sort of correlation, causation that you all might be experiencing as well. Thank you. Thank you, yep. Madam Chair. Yep. Representative Howerton. Madam Chair, are you partnering with schools or is there any discussion to do that? Ooh, and I would love for Dr. Jackson to answer that because it's a good one. It is. You know, that's our having when you're meeting with a family and it comes down to finances and you know that the child needs help, that that's the hardest moment. Our long term goal as a company has always been to be able to partner with schools where in organizations that can provide funding so that every child that needs it is able to benefit from the services. We want equitable access. Um, so we've done, we had our first um, school pilot. Um, that was the study that I just mentioned. We are in conversation right now um, with a large public school district. Um, so that's, it's going to be a slow roll <laughs> for, for lack of better terminology. This is um, a slow process, um, but as we've seen more and more studies, as we have more evidence demonstrating the change in outcomes that we're seeing across all domains, the impact on the classroom, the impact on cognition, the impact that brain health has on mental health, um, we are moving in that direction. We're just moving in that direction slowly and cautiously, um, but that is a long-term goal. And on a different topic, just to follow up, it says drug free. You're not meeting medication. You're meeting like illegal drugs. Is that what you're meaning? What we actually do, and it mean that our program does not include medication as part of the program, whether or not a child is on on um, any sort of medication. We just don't have that as part of it. Right. Yeah. Is, great, great question. Medication being between the doctors. So I was just curious. Sure. Yeah. Thank you. So. I, I think our first uh, meeting that we had this year for this committee, we had a presentation on ACEs. Mm -hmm. And okay. I, uh, yeah, I, I was going to ask a question about that, and then um, it was answered in some of the, some of your comments. Um, so, but I, I still, I, I'm not sure how I want to put this question together, but we have an issue with the foster kids not getting, um, the mental health um, evaluations that they need um, in in the amount of time that we mm. ask for them to be done. Sure. And um, do you have any involvement with that? Or, or could you speak to that? Sure. So do you mean, like, take my brain balance hat off and put my therapy hat on? Sure. I don't directly. I have a lot of, you know, connections in the mental health community with a lot of graduates, but I hear what you're saying, and it is a common chorus. Um, I, I probably get 10 calls a week from people asking who can get my child in or who can get me in, who is taking clients. And I spend a significant amount of time trying to connect people to clinicians and organizations that are taking new patients. So it is certainly I'm not surprised to hear that because that's where we are. Yeah, it's, it's, um, uh, you know, we, we look for what, where the gaps are in our foster care system. And, um, that's certainly one of them. The, Absolutely. And there just aren't enough providers. It seems to be right. Representative Carr. Thank you again, Madam Chair. Um, just, uh, for the committee um, to give you some background on how this um, presentation came to be. Um, during uh, the one and only campaign that uh, I ran, I um, was having a conversation with another individual who was um, on campaign and uh, that young lady seated in the back, um, Kelly Grant. Um, and uh, I was um, just speaking about a childhood friend um, that I had that um, he was he was different, um, and my entire life I've wondered just exactly what was wrong with him and, and different 
Um, he was he was like Superman. You couldn't hurt him. You know, no matter you know, he'd jump off a building and he'd get up and he'd laugh and he he he'd run off. You know, and we were all kids the same uh, the same age, but he was he was different. We used to play horrible horrible kid jokes on him. Um, you know, in fact, we had him put his hand one time on a on a hot stove burner. You know, didn't phase him. Um, now, of course, the next day he had you know it was third degree burns, but you know, it, it, it never, never hurt him at all. And I would, I would speak about him sometimes and, and doing a conversation, um, you know, immediately um, she had an answer. She knew exactly what it was and, 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 and how he got there. And so, uh, and so that um, intrigued me. And, and so I spoke with her at that point um, about um, taking a tour of the facility uh, because I was, you know, intrigued that in, um, you know, all my 23 years, because I'm only 23 years old this time, um, no one had ever had ever given me, um, uh, you know, uh, any inclination that they even understood um, what was wrong with him. And it was a question that I I'd had all my life. And um, uh, she was able to um, provide an answer. And, and during the the, uh, the um, tour that we took, um, you know, she even um, uh, gave us an explanation as to how you would work through that. So um, if you're wondering how I wound up um, uh, asking for them to come and, and, and do this presentation, um, that's how we got there. So, and, and a question um, to you with respect to um, why we're unable to, um, uh, and it's, it's, it's you're unable to bill Medicaid, is that correct? Yes, that is correct. And if I understand correctly, there's a, a coding issue. Yes. Is, is that right? Correct. Um, is there, you're in Minnesota as well. Yes. Does Minnesota face the same issue or have they worked through that? Correct. No, it's not the same issue. Um, both states are a little bit different. Wisconsin has Medicaid waiver funding that we access and they have a whole category under which we can bill through that has allowed our services to be brought to their community. Minnesota's a bit different. It's not Medicaid waiver funding, but it is similar. And again, we have a code that we can bill through. So we've been able to, uh, they've been able to make space for additional providers that in, and ways that include our services. And Kansas simply doesn't have that code, is that correct? Correct, right. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, back to the ACEs, it, 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 it brings full circle then the physiological reasons why, yeah. I mean, what that causes Absolutely. the body and the brain. Absolutely. Representative neighbor. You were talking about the different systems, and I think it kind of goes along with uh, Representative's car question. Is it because part of what you do is a holistic approach, and they're not, they don't, our insurance companies are not into holistic right now. And um, so there are some companies in other places that are learning more about it and that it does work. Um, the reason I know is because if you're in aging and wellness, it's a mixture of uh, Western medicine and holistic, and they don't cover it. But we deal with hormones in men and women all the time. So it's part of life. Is that a, an issue from it being from that standpoint? I, I think it is. I think what I'd say in addition is that it is that we don't provide that diagnostic code and, and we don't do that because as for all the reasons that you've heard. So for example, in Wisconsin, our code is other professional services, right? Other services. And yes, that's gonna include both of those. Yes. You know, um, our, our system in Kansas is privatized, yes. so we have the three MCOs. Are any of the other states that where it's covered with Medicaid privatized like we are? I know that Minnesota, I believe Minnesota is. I am not sure if Wisconsin is privatized or not. I would need to, and Kelly, do you happen to know the answer to that? Off, I don't know it off the top of my head either would be interesting to find that out. Yeah, and, for sure. Well, 
Any other questions, committee? Yeah, Representative Howerton. I'll note, um, I think Friends does a really good job with their counseling center. Thank I've you. several people there and they've really gotten some help. I will so. pass the word back to the Center on Family Living. Thank you. About 8,000 hours of mental health delivered out of that clinic a year. Yeah. Any other questions? Well, thank you so much, both of you, thank you. <clears throat> for being here. And um, I think after we had some conversation after our visit there that um, we, we thought it would be uh, that the committee would find this very interesting. Sure. But, you know, to start that conversation, to see if we could ever get to the position where um, we, we could find some a way to um, code it, to have a, have a code to be able to bill Medicaid and, and help our child welfare. Representative Pickert. Thank you, Madam Chair. Do you have a wait list to get in? We do not. You don't? We are wow. ready and available now. Wow, that's yes. amazing. Yeah. Okay, good to know. <laughs> Thank you for asking. How many locations do you have in Kansas? In Kansas, we have Wichita. This is the center that I own. We do have three centers in the Kansas City metro. So there's one in Lee Summit, just technically Missouri, and then Overland Park and North um, Kansas City. Great. Representative Howerton. I was just going to say, can we have research look into that? Is that something we can request with the states and the privatization and the differences maybe between our state and their state where it's approved? Natalie says, yes. <laughs> Representative Powell. Thank you, Chair. Um, I was just wondering, do you charge the same rate for your adult programs as you do your child programs? Yes. Flat, right? And you don't offer any, like, group treatments for... Like no. adults or anything? Mm -mm. Okay. It is all coach based. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. okay. Representative Pickard. I know we keep Thought thinking of things as we talk. It's fine. I am happy. I love this. Do you work with um, children with uh, uh, intellectual and developmental disabilities? We can definitely, depending on the nature of those, and, and Dr. Jackson could speak to that as well. We know that we cannot change genetic influences, obviously, but depending on what that person needs and what kind of changes that they're looking for, we'll assess and determine if we can help. I know some have um, severe behavioral problems. Absolutely. You know, um, so they may not have the intellectual capacity, but Sure. Okay, yeah, and you. depending on that, we um, we're trained. Our our coaches are very specially trained, depending on the level of that child or adult and what their capacity is. So it doesn't have to always be a verbal, you know, processing person. We do have some specialized training to handle our more difficult kids and adults. Yeah, you bet. Representative Carr. Thank you again, Madam Chair. Last question, I promise. You're Kinda. fine. Um, uh, so do you work with, with, with autistic children as well? We do. Yes. Thank you. I just recently learned that, um, that people with autism um, process quite a bit more information um, than we do, um, up to 45% more. So I just... Um, I would hate to think that I could consume 45% more <laughs> of anything. <laughs> and I will say that in Minnesota, on the Minnesota side, our um, CDCS waiver is almost exclusively uh, children with an autism diagnosis. They're coming through that waiver program through our center. Yeah. Um, what information was, were you going to have sent? I think Rebecca's going to send the. Um, okay, I'll do a follow-up email linking some studies, and Michelle, I'll send that to you and Perfect. have you okay. pass along to the committee. And if you would just send that to Judy, absolutely, and uh, then she will be able to make sure that we all get it. Wonderful, including the staff. So, thank you. Okay, thank uh, you. Thank you. Any more questions, comments? Thank you. Thank you very much for being here. Um, Committee might all have um, Susan Humphreys in your thoughts. Her, her brother passed away, and she's attending his funeral today. Um, so Wednesday we have um, we have iGrad here, which is a program that, that um, I 
believe it's just in Wichita, but helping our foster kids graduate. So I think with that, we're adjourned. <laughs>